Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, as we enter into this second chapter of the book of Ephesians. Of course, the chapters and verses are not original in the Bible. They are added for the help of the reader to be able to locate and find things. Sometimes, though, chapter divisions can actually hurt the reader because they divide a thought that should not be divided and gives a false impression. Here today, though, we turn to one of the greatest passages in the whole Bible. And you come to, you come to all the Bible, but you come to a passage like this, it's something like going to Psalm 23, and if you don't feel unworthy, it's because you're just not a humble man. We're unworthy to look at these great truths, and yet we would be fools not to try to gain from what God has given us. And today, if you will, under the theme, under these, this theme, I want us to look at a handful of verses in chapter 2 under every Christian's testimony. Many times we have testimonies, and in fact, I would like to have more testimonies at times given by Christians here at the church And it's good to hear how the Lord worked in someone's heart. It's good to hear the background of someone, how the Lord worked in their life, how God orchestrated events to bring that person to faith and to repentance and maybe the very unexpected ways the gospel came to that person's life and soul. And yet, in one sense, all those differences in our life are nothing but surface issues when it comes to our testimony. They're good to think about. They're good to remember. We praise God for them. We need to hear about them. We need to know about them. That's the the hand of God working in our life in different ways, bringing us to humility. Maybe it was a grandmother. Maybe it was a gospel track. Maybe it was like A.W. Tozer passing by once in the night and simply heard someone standing on the street corner preaching. And I don't know if he ever knew who that was, but he said, if you want to know God, go and cry out to Him. And that's exactly what A.W. Tozer did. He went home and cried out to God, and God saved him that night. Those things are important, and yet those things are the surface issues. Today, what I want us to see as, as a body of Christians, I want us to see what is true for every single Christian who has ever lived in the history of the world going as far back to the Old Testament as today and to however long the world ends, this is every Christian's testimony. These are the things that are true of us no matter where we come from, no matter what age we are, no matter how God brought us to repentance. These things in Ephesians chapter 2 are true for us no matter what. And I want us to begin today, we're going to see four big things, God willing. And I want you to begin in verse 1, and this is the first thing that was true for every single Christian who has ever lived and will live, and it's this. We were born dead to God. That's not a popular message. That's not something you'll hear a lot about. That's not something who wants to somebody something that somebody who's going to slap you on the back is going to tell you and and say all things are all right. You're taking things too seriously in the realm of, of religion. This is the truth of every single one of us, brothers and sisters here. And if you're not a Christian, it's true of you. This very morning, it ought to terrify you, is that we are born dead to God. Listen to what the apostle says in verse 1. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You see, Paul's been talking about in chapter 1, he's been going through the blessings of what it means to be in Christ. He has been going through all the blessings of God in Christ Jesus that he has done from eternity past, that we have experienced in time. And he was praying for God to open our eyes, and he was praying about the great power that raised Christ from the dead. And part of what we see here, starting in chapter 2, is first of all, we see the power of Christ 
Christ that raised us from the dead because we were dead in our sins and trespasses, but we also see a continuation this morning of the blessing of God to us and what he's done for us. Here's the blessing of God to us that we were dead. And notice what we were dead in. We were dead in trespasses and sins. You've only ever met two people in your whole life. You have met people who are dead in sin or you have met people who are alive in Christ. Those are the only two people you've ever met. There's no in between. You have either met someone who is a dead man walking. Remember what Jesus said when people are wanting to follow him and and they said, Lord, we will follow you, but let me go bury my father first. And Jesus gave an answer that may be On the surface, a little confusing, Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. And what I believe he's saying there is this, let the spiritually dead bury their physically dead people. Go let them take care of that. We were born in sin. We were born in transgressions. We were born without a relationship with God. What's that mean for us? Let me give you a handful of practical things here on this first verse. Number one, what that means is none of us were born Christians. If you talk to a Muslim, as I have talked to Muslims before, and maybe you ask them, this really, you really shouldn't ask them this because you know what they're going to say. You ask them, when did you become a Muslim? Well, the answer is, well, I was a Muslim by birth. That's what they believe. And yet there's never been a Christian by birth. We are not born Christians from birth. No one is born a Christian. You sometimes will will meet people and they'll say, you know what, I just want to draw closer to God. And yet if they're not a Christian, they cannot draw closer to God because they're dead to God. They don't know God. What this means is this, in and of ourself, we have never sought for God. We saw that in Romans 3 last Sunday evening. In and of ourselves, we have never cried out to God. And sometimes the picture of salvation is you've got a man who fell over the edge of a ship and he's there in the water and he's barely swimming. He's about to go under. He's crying for help. And that's the picture sometimes that, that is given by evangelists of people who are just crying out to God. They're, they're, they're still alive, but they need help. And what the Bible says in this verse is this, that is not the picture at all of reality. Yes, we sought God and yes, we cried out for God, but the only reason we did is because God first came to us and did a great work in our heart. That's it. That's it. To be dead to God means we are against God It means we are actively hiding, just like Adam and Eve did in our sins. It means basically this, we have no relationship with God when we are born. That's what it means. When I was born and when I grew up and when I was 6, 7, 8, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, and on, as I lived my life, I had no relationship with God. That's what it means to be dead to God. I had no relationship with him. I was cut off as Adam and Eve were cast from the garden. And as when, when God said, the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. In the same way, we are born in spiritual death. There is no life within us. And we are in desperate need for God to come and knock on our heart. And do more than knock on our heart. To come and work in that heart of ours. Here is something to think about. And some of you no doubt have done this maybe on visitation years ago or maybe even recently. You've come to someone at their house and they haven't been to church in five years or whatever. But they're a, they're a good old boy. And you, you try to get them back into church. They haven't darkened a door in years, maybe even decades. And they say, ah, oh, preacher... I know I need to get back in church. It's the right thing to do. I just, I, I got to get back in. You are, you are talking to a dead man when you talk to someone like that. It's like someone saying, Ah, oh, doctor, I know I need to take my medicine. Ah, oh, doctor, I know I need to exercise. 
That's the furthest thing from their heart. They don't want to exercise. They don't want their medicine. And in the same way, when we go to people who for decade after decade, they've had no spiritual desire. They could care less about the worship of God with the saints. They, they never read the Bible. They don't pray. Well, everyone prays. We all know that. Quote, unquote, pray. But when you run into people like that, though we may not tell them that when we're talking, we need wisdom at that moment, the fact is this, we're talking to a dead man who has no life in him, who has no spiritual vitality. It's someone who has no relationship with God. They are dead. And it reminds me of the pastor who often goes to cemeteries, and he says, I go to cemeteries for two reasons. I go because I need to be reminded that I'm going to be here one day. And two, I go to cemeteries because I need to be reminded that as I preach God's Word, I have as much power to save men as I do to raise the dead out here in the cemetery. Men are dead. We need to know that in our evangelism. We need to know that for our own soul's sake, because when we become Christians, of course we don't know everything that, that happened to us. It's, it's very similar to when we were born. I mean, how can we know everything when we're actually born physically? How, I mean, obviously we can't remember these things, but we, we begin to discover these things. We begin to look at pictures. We begin to hear stories. We begin to learn more about the circumstances of our birth. And in the same way, we as Christians, every one of us have the same testimony. It begins this way. We were dead. We were dead. And then it goes to this. In our deadness, we walked in sin. Verse 2. Each and every one of us here can say, not only was I dead before I became a Christian, but I walked in sin because I was dead. Look what it says in verse 2. In which you formerly, notice Paul says to these Christians, in which you formerly walked. What's that mean? That means when you become a Christian, God does something to you and you no longer live a life of sin. When you become a Christian, when you become alive in Christ, and when I became alive in Christ, what that meant was, yes, I have spiritual life within me, but that means because I have spiritual life, I no longer walk in sin. I'm a new person in Christ. And notice what he says here. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. Before we were saved, you know what our habit of life was? We weren't free. We walked just like everybody else walked in the world. Of course, we may have some different political ideas. We may have a few different values. The bottom line is this. We were worldly. Now, I want, you, I want to read to you a statement from a pastor on worldliness. I think this is helpful. Normally, what we think of as worldliness is drunkenness and having sex outside of marriage, and worshiping pa pagan gods. We think of worldliness like that. The bottom line is this. Worldliness is far more reaching than these awful, gross, outward sins. Here's what one pastor says. He says, but it becomes worldliness if it absorbs us too much. If my interest in these things becomes central in my life and takes the first place, or drives out the spiritual, and my concentration on the eternal, then I am guilty of worldliness. What's he saying? He's saying that it doesn't have to be something that's sinful, so to speak, to be worldliness. It's just that this thing, maybe even a good thing in and of itself, before I was a Christian, it so consumed me that all my attention went to this, and that is the definition of worldliness. We are drawn away from Christ. We are not thinking about spiritual things. We are not consumed with God, if you will. We are consumed with us and our plans. And brothers and sisters, that's how every single one of us walked before we were Christians. We walked after the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air. The word prince there just means ruler. The Bible says before we were saved, we walked after the, the, the rulership of the devil. Now you see that word there, the prince 
of the power of the air. What does it mean for him to be the prince of the power of the air? And all I think that means is, where is air? Well, air is everywhere in this world. What that is saying is, all this world belongs to the devil. And when you were lost and not a Christian, you were under the rulership, the lordship of the ruler of this world, which is the devil. And then I want you to see the last part of verse 2. And this is very scary. And this is very much what we need to know and what lost people need to know as well. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You see that word spirit there? Oftentimes when we think of spiritual people, we are thinking of Christians. And yet, at the same time, we can say this, every single one of us are spiritual before and after our conversion. We are spiritual in that we know God when we become Christians. But before we know God, there is a spiritual component to us, and that spiritual component is that there is spiritual beings at work in our life and in our world. If you read the book of Daniel, you find out there are demons who rule nations, that are over nations. Why is it that countries and societies can do so many weird, just ungodly things that you almost have to invent because it's because demons are in control of countries? You think wicked rulers are in control. That's not what the Bible would teach. It is, it is powers, it is spiritual forces and powers that are in control. Just turn to Ephesians 6 and see exactly what I mean. Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 12, the Bible says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. He's not talking about positive forces. It's the powers of darkness that we are up against. The world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is what we're up against. And before we were saved, this was partly true of us. Listen as I read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, The Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith. That's the Holy Spirit saying that. How will they fall away? Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. How do you pay attention to a deceitful spirit? Well, obviously a spirit can speak to you. But that passage is talking about ungodly, wicked spirits using men to speak lies. That's how. Before we were saved, do you know why people like Joe Olstein, do you know why they have a huge following? I'm talking about millions of people. He doesn't preach the gospel. He doesn't talk about sin. Do you know why he has a huge following? It's because lost people love what he says. Why do some of these other false teachers, why can they pack the house so well? Why are, why can they do these things? Well, it's because lost people love to be dominated by false teachers. Because lost people are dead and they walk in sin. Let me ask you a question. We who are Christians, Is this not true for us this morning, brothers and sisters? We think about a verse like verse 2. We think about our past life. Do we not literally become sick at times when we think about the life we once lived? Have you ever not felt nauseated when you think about the sins you committed? Everyone's testimony is different. I, when I think of, and I had, I had a, in, in a secular sense, I had a good elementary, middle school, and high school experience in my life. I did. I was healthy, played sports, had friends, etc. 
When I look back now, after becoming a Christian, when I was around 20 years old, when I look back now at the life I lived, it's almost as if I'm looking at someone I don't even know. I was not in to any outward, outward is the key word, outward gross sin. I had a, a, a mild film of morality covering me. Thank God for my parents and my church upbringing. I had these things in my life. But when I look back to my high school years and my middle school years, it's almost as if I'm looking at someone I don't even know and I literally feel like I'm a, a new person now. And I am. And so are you. If you've become a Christian, you are a new person in Christ Jesus. You are not the same old sinner you used to be. You have been transformed. And we look back on our past life and sometimes we can get emotional and we think about the years we wasted. And I think about my high school, the people I could have been influencing. I think about the friends I had in middle school and the people I could influence for Christ. And I think about what I could have been. And maybe you feel that way. And we ought to feel bad about these things. And we ought to be sad about these things. They ought to humble us, but not to falsely humble us where we have no hope for tomorrow. Because if your past is this, and all of our past is, the only difference is how long did that last and to what degree did we go? That's the only difference. All of us can look back at our past with sorrow. We can all look at wasted years. We can all look, oh, I wish I could have done things differently. Yes, yes, yes. But if you allow that to stop you today, you have given in to the devil because that's what he wants Christians to do. If, if the devil cannot make Christians wicked, he will make, as J.C. Ryle said, he will make them busy or he will also make them look back and waste time at days they, can't not change. they cannot change. If you are a Christian, yes, we have sorrow in our heart for our past sins and that ought to keep us from ever wanting to go back into the past sins. And yet, if we are a Christian, thank God today and go forward with them. Amen and amen. Then look in verse 3. Not only were we dead, that's every one of our testimonies, not only did we walk in deadness in sins, every one of us did that no matter what age we were when we were saved, but thirdly, there's no exceptions. There are no exceptions to what I'm saying this morning. Zero. Let me put it bluntly. <laughs> you are not an exception. I am not an exception. Look what it says in verse 3. Among them we too. What's Paul getting at? Paul is saying we too. Who's the we here? It's the Jews. Now, for the most part in this book, when Paul speaks, he speaks for every Christian. We saw one place in chapter 1 where he did make a distinction. And later in this chapter, he's going to talk about how Jew and Gentile have been brought together into one. Here in verse 3, he, he makes a distinction and he says, Among them we too, the religious Jews who grew up with the Bible, who grew up knowing who the true God was, we too, who were raised in, for our day, a Christian home, we would say. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of home you come from. We too, says Paul, we all were just like this. There's no exceptions. You can raise, and we ought to try to raise our kids the best we can, but you can raise your kids the best you can, and they're still dead toward God until God gives them life. That's, that's the reality of it. He says in verse 3, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Again, our sins may look differently. Some sins are easier to recognize. You think of drug abuse. You think of a, a lifestyle of adultery and sin. 
Other sins are quote-unquote respectable sins, maybe sins of pride, maybe sins of neglect. Regardless of where it's at, the Bible says here in verse 3, everyone lived in the lust of their flesh and gave in to their flesh and to their mind. And look what he says, and were by nature children of wrath. Every one of us were children of wrath. The Apostle Paul, an apostle separated from his mother's womb, separated to God to be an apostle, he says. Guess what? He was born under wrath because he was a sinner. He was a sinner before God, even as the rest. What's this mean here? It means that no matter if we, if we are or were wealthy, middle class, or poor, whether it is public school, private school, or home school, whether it is we've been formally educated or no formal education, whether we were raised in a Christian home or raised in a lawless home, whether we are young, middle-aged, or older, whether we grew up with the Bible and memorized it or had no Bible at all, whether Democrat, Republican, or Independent, the Bible tells us that each and every one of us were under sin and born into sin. And we too, like everyone else, was dead to God. Well, that's a, that's a picture, isn't it? It's a picture we need to know about. You know, we all, some, some of you may have done genealogies. You've tried to find out where you, where you, where you come from. You want to know, when it comes down to it, you may really just want to know the truth. You may want, you may want the truth to be good, though. You may want to come from kings and princes and all that stuff. The reality is, when we look at our spiritual genealogy, we find out we're all sons and daughters of Adam. And we find out each and every one of us have nothing good within us whatsoever. And we find out by ourselves. If we were left to ourselves, we would be just like Adam and Eve in the garden, hiding from God, enjoying our sin. That's the reality. But there's something else for us to see here. And it's true of every single Christian on earth. And it's that God came down and rescued us one day. Amen. And it's that when we could not help ourselves, God helped us. And it's that when we were not looking for God, God came looking for us. And it's that though we were dead in sins, God looked at us and said, live. And it's that though we were wandering far from the fold of God, the shepherd of our souls came to seek us. And it's that though we wanted nothing with God, God said, I want you though and I'm coming to get you. And I'm going to love you. And I'm going to change your heart. And you're going to be mine. You're mine. It says in verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love, His love from eternity, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive. Notice there in verse 4, it does not say, but man. Aren't you glad? It's politics season. Guess what that season is also? It's, it's, the seasons of it's the season of trusting man. You can forget about man saving you. You can forget about a political party saving America. Yes, what I would say is anytime we vote, we, we are always Christians and we want to look at the issues and we want to vote, maybe even at times, for the lesser of two evils. The fact is this, though, no one's going to save us. It does not say here in verse 4, but man. There is no hope in man. There is no hope in politics. There is no hope within. You may say, and people have said before, salvation is from within. Then friends, we are all corrupt and we're all miserable and there's no hope because there's nothing good within us. 
God, when He came down and He saved us, He did not save us because He saw something good. He did not save us because He knew there was something valuable within us and we just had to be planted in a certain way and we would bring forth this wonderful fruit. God came down and saved us because He loved us. And as I was thinking about this last week, I just had to ask myself, why does He love us for? Have you ever thought that before? Why does God love us? We've done everything in our life to be unlovable to God. We've done everything in our life, even after we become Christians. We sin. What is that? It's saying, God, stop loving me. It's saying, God, I wish you never saved me to begin with. It's saying, oh, wasn't it good in Egypt? We had all of our food and everything was ready. Don't we want to turn back to Egypt? And as the Israelites, Acts tells us, in their heart they turned back to Egypt. Friends, have we not at times in our life turned back to Egypt? And yet, but God. This, these two little words, but God, and, and making us alive, this is the message of the entire Bible. This is Adam and Eve sinning. But God, who came down into the garden to save them. This is the Israelites in slavery in Egypt to a taskmaster they cannot get rid of. They cannot free themselves. But God, who sent Moses to rescue them and to deliver them with a strong hand and to do things only God could do. This is the message of the Bible. This is the flood. God has saw the wickedness of man's heart that it is only wicked continually from their youth. I am going to send a flood and wipe out man. But God, who gave grace to Noah and spared the human race. This is the story of the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, walking, not only walking contrary to God, but walking in sin, persecuting the church. But God came down to him and met him as he's going to kill Christians. Met him. And this is our story this morning. I don't know your particular testimony, but every one of us here can say I was going my own way. I was doing my own thing. I wasn't looking for God. And all of a sudden, but God came down to me. It may be something shocking. It may be like a lightning bolt. Or the Lord came down and worked slowly in your life. It's all different. That's that's where the differences come into our testimonies. But the fact is this, our life, whether we thought it was going good or bad, we were walking in sin in the course of this world, but God came down at a revival meeting one night. But God came down as you were driving to work one night. But God came down and slowly and gently wooed your heart, but God. That's the message. And my friends, it's the only message. It's the only message. It is the message of the Bible. I have nothing good. If it's up to me, I'm walking contrary to God. Why do snakes leave a fire pit? They don't want to get burnt. That's it. But God came down and met with undeserving people. God uses bad sermons. We all should try to preach good. We all should try to be biblical. Our lessons should be biblical. And yet God even uses things that aren't up to standards to convert men and women. But God. God uses imperfect parents to see children saved. But God. God uses imperfect churches to reach a community. But God. And when you come down to it, from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22, you can just say this, but God. That's it. That's our entire life. That's our entire existence. I went this way, but God said, no, you're not going to go that way. You're going to come with me. And I'm going to change your heart. And you're going to like it. 
and you're going to love me. But God, that's it. That's our testimony. That's our life. Our hope is not in slick methods. Our hope, now this may sound strange. Now listen carefully. Our hope is not even in preaching. Though that is the primary means that God uses. Our hope is in God. That's it. Our hope is in God to disturb men's souls on golf courses and at school and in woods and on fishing boats. Our hope is for God to come down in our children's rooms and take just a little something that they heard somewhere and begin to deal with their heart. That's what our hope, our hope is God, not man. God, not us. That's our hope. And that's what Paul is saying here. Let me give you some signs of being alive to God. Number one, as I've already said, though I'll mention it again, when you become alive to God, you leave your sins. Notice back in verse 1, and you were, past tense. Verse 2, in which you formerly, you don't anymore, you used to though. Verse 3, among them we too all formerly. When someone becomes alive to God, they leave their sins. And they begin the process, though they have repented and they want rid of all their sins, and yet God will bring more sins to their mind and they will repent more. And one of the signs of being alive to God is this, our sin begins to look even worse after we become a Christian because we're alive now to God. If we're alive to God, we walk contrary to the world. Verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. When you become a Christian, you no longer walk after the things of the world. You have been turned from that evil course and you have turned your back on the world and you are now crucified with Christ. The world is crucified to you and you are crucified to the world. You have been, you have experienced a death that you may experience life in Christ. When you become alive, there's a new awareness about you. You may have always believed that there was a God in heaven. And maybe like me, you never questioned it for one second as a lost person. But when you become a Christian, it's like reaching out and touching fire. You have now experienced that. You become aware of God. You become aware of sin in your life. You become aware that there's other people. This life isn't about me. I'm aware now. Something, something has happened in my, in my, I have, I now have a new nature. I'm, I'm spiritual. I'm aware of things in my life. When you become alive to God, and this is one of the telltale signs, you get an appetite. As many of you know, one of the signs that someone is about to die is they lose their appetite for food. And they don't eat. And maybe you have to force feed someone to get them back to health. Well, one of the signs that God's life has come within us is all of a sudden we have an appetite for the things of God. The Bible is a living book now. It cuts me. It makes me happy and sad. But it's a living book. I want to sing praises to God. Now, brothers and sisters, our heart and our spiritual life grows as we grow as Christians. So we are always pressing forward. And you, you may know, maybe, maybe you're y younger or youngish here, and you may know an older Christian who's been saved 30, 40 years, godly man or godly woman. That is something to look to. In one sense, don't expect to be that person tomorrow, though. With that said, when God saves a man, He instantly transforms the man or woman and they have an appetite for the things of God now. They miss God. You know, I never miss God in, in, in 19 years or so of my entire life. I never miss God one time. You know why? Because I never had Him. But when I became a Christian, all of a sudden there's such a thing as missing God. When I became a Christian, all of a sudden there's such a thing as backsliding. I couldn't backslide before. Why? I, I never slid forward. 
I was always back. When, you, when, when, when life comes in you, there's an appetite. But when life comes in you, you understand, I can miss God. You understand what it is to grow spiritually weak. Before, you couldn't grow spiritually weak because you had no spiritual strength to begin with. But now there's such a thing as I feel spiritually weak. I haven't been praying like I should. That must be it. I haven't been fellowshipping. That must be it. You see, when you become alive to God, these things begin to struggle. There are, be, begins to change. There are struggles now in your life. It's just like the little chick. The little chick's been safely in that egg for about 17 or 18 days, and now it's about 19 days, and things are getting uncomfortable, and all of a sudden you begin to see cracks in the egg, and that little chick begins now to have to struggle and struggle and struggle for himself to get out of that egg. That's what happens when you become alive to God. There's now struggle in your life. There was no struggle before. The devil had you. Why are you struggling for? You had no life. But now God brings his life into you. And now the strangest thing happened, didn't it? You got a little mad and you said something to a friend. And you went home and you couldn't let it go. And you went to bed and you can't let it go. And you feel as strange as it seems, it's almost like you've got to go talk to that person. You've never done. What happened? You've become alive to God. And the Spirit of God's not going to leave you alone. And praise God for that. You've become alive. And when it comes down to it, what does it mean to be alive? It means that you know God now. That's what eternal life is. You have come to know God. You have come to miss Him when you're away from Him, but you have come to know Him and to know what it is to commune with God. You know what it's like to have the love of God poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit. You've experienced that because every Christian does, according to Romans 5. You know what it's like to commune with God. You know what it's like to want to praise Him now and to give thanks to Him. You may even know what it's like to be out in the woods and you're looking at the creation of God and you just start thanking God. What happened to you? You've become alive to God. It's all by grace through faith. And it's all Him seeking you. I want you to look at one passage with me. Ezekiel 36. <clears throat> The book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, this Old Testament book, gives us a picture of what it is to be alive to God and dead to sin. I want you to listen to, I'm going to read about four verses. <clears throat> This is speaking of the Lord's work in our hearts, giving new birth, saving men and women. This is most likely the passage that Jesus is referring to when he says in John 3, you must be born of water and spirit. That's what this passage says. This is life from the dead. By the way, when you think of John 3 again, and then after he talks about water and spirit, he says you... The Spirit blows where He wishes. That's most likely Ezekiel 37 when the Spirit of God comes and gives life to dead bones. Jesus is referring back to Ezekiel when He speaks about the new birth. John, or Ezekiel 36, verse 25. <clears throat> then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. What is it to be born of water? is to be cleansed by spiritual water, by the blood of Christ. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. God cleanses us. He, clean, he cleans us up 
Verse 26, Moreover, I will give you a new heart. You're alive now. And put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. That is dead in sin. Go over to a stone statue, if you will, like it's been said, pinch it, kick it, slap it, whatever you want, and it's not going to do a thing to you. It's made of stone. But do that to a man and see what happens. Do that to the biggest man you know and see what... Well, he's, he's not a man of stone. He's a man of flesh. He's a man of living material. God takes the heart of stone out of our hearts and God gives us a new heart. God puts His Spirit within us. And now look in verse 27. I will put My Spirit within you and cause you to walk in My statutes. You see, there's no option here. You don't pick Jesus as Lord 30 years after you become a Christian and say, you know what? I'm going to follow Him now. No, when you become alive... It says, and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You're going to be careful to obey me now. Yes, you may step off the path. Yes, you may backslide. Yes, we've got to grow. The the, the main point is this though. The Spirit of God is working inside of our heart. He's going to bring us back to repentance. And we will be careful to obey our God. But then I want you to look at a verse that I've really not pointed out maybe with you all before. Verse 31. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. That's what it means to be alive to God. We loathe the things we once loved. We loathe the things we once participated in. Even as Christians, we think back to times in our life when we were less than faithful. And we loathe it. And we say, God, forgive me. The good news for us, as we have sang this morning, is that's the kind of God we serve. If you have a new heart, a new life, and yet you have gone back, the Lord says, come back to me. And I'll refresh and renew you. And if you're here and your heart is still a heart of stone, you've never been born again before. Cry out to God for mercy. Humble yourself before Him. God, Beat your chest. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I believe your promises. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Give me life. Let me know what it is to fellowship with the living God and to know you. And amen. And amen.